turn to page number 343. Page number 343. Let's all stand and sing the Bible again. 343. We pr what? Where you at? Are you on the wrong one? Or I put the wrong number on yours. What did I do? I know it's because right. I'd okay. I'm not beyond it. No. 343. Which book have you got? Okay. All right. I, I know I'm in trouble, y'all. I forget a lot, so that's not that's not unusual. I was trying to figure out now what did I do? But when I came over here and looked, and I had three forty three, I thought we got too many books on that piano. That's what's wrong. <laughs> that's all right. Three forty three. Now we'll get there. <laughs> we praise thee, O God, by the sign of thy love. For her Jesus who died is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Five us again. We praise thee, O God, by the spirit of light. Who has shown us our Savior, scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. By us again. Revive us again. With thy love. May each soul be rekindled, fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Five us again. Turn to page number 23. Page number 23. There is power in the blood. Page number 23. Would you be free from your burden of sin? Power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you are evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power, the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power, precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for the cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power. The blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power. Just blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power. The blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank you tonight for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for being allowed to be here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy to us. Lord, we thank you for the services we've had thus far. Lord, we thank you for uh, the sickness and the safety of the chapel in the last uh, few days. I uh, also pray, Lord, for the chapel service tomorrow. Of the, uh, on the preacher tonight, is the 
message in this upon us, Lord, as we as we listen, Lord, as we be attent unto uh, the preaching of the word of God and see that we respond uh, appropriate, Lord, whether we need to be saved, whether we need uh, to surrender our hearts in some way. Uh, Lord, I pray that you allow us to do that. Father, we pray for those who want to be here tonight. Pray for my wife, Lord, as she continues to recover from surgery. Uh, Lord, I just pray for you and for her. Pray, Lord, body, pray for Ms. Uh, Helen, Lord, also, and for Ms. Ruth, Lord, I pray that you her help with her, her body, Lord, to be able to regain her health. And Father, I know there's others that uh, are sick or others that are uh, uh, contemplating or surgery or whatever, Lord, it might be, Lord, I pray that you be upon them. Father, again, we ask you to bless your service, my Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, may be seated, appreciate you being here tonight, I uh, appreciate you. Uh, young group coming in, the youth group coming in tonight, and uh, that just keeps me from having to do music. <laughs> Brother Roy's sitting up there going, wait a minute, I'm here. So, anyway, but uh, I appreciate y'all being here tonight. We've had a, a great time in our chapel. appreciate the, those that have come and visited with us in our chapel services. Uh, it's been a blessing to have them. Kids. We have six days over the last two days. We have three days on Tuesday, three days today. And uh, so, brother, uh, brother Jimmy said, "Well, that must be uh, the uh, spiritual number right there, three, three. So, uh, I don't know. That's over six. And we're looking forward to what God's going to do. The kids have really responded well uh, to the messages, and so we're looking forward to having uh, preach again tomorrow. Then we'll have Friday. We'll have the uh, youth rally." Just pray that we'll have a number of youth that are here. Um, they'll be uh, challenged, those who are saved and saved as well. And uh, yeah, God will bless abundantly. Uh, continue to pray for my wife, who's doing well. Uh, she's uh, getting up and down a lot easier. She's not quite as much pain. I'm uh, trying to stop the uh, narcotic pain medication she's using uh, Tylenol now. Her uh, pain pump that they put in, uh, she's at the surgery site. She'll uh, come off tomorrow. Pray for me because I'm the one that has to take it off. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, and so uh, that'd be interesting. Uh, the nurse said, Do you think you can do it? I said, Sure, no problem. Not a problem at all. Uh, it used to years ago when I had to do stuff like that, it was, it was not good. Uh, I'm not, I don't like needles. I don't like uh, anything that has to do with, uh, with blood or bodily fluids at all. And uh, just through the years, I've learned how to handle it. Have to do what you have to do to do it. And uh, the doctor told us we had to give, give um, Michael a piece of 12 shots. And I came home and told Karen, I said, the doctor said you have to give uh, Michael a piece of 12 shots. <laughs> and she goes, uh, she goes, I'm not giving him any shots. And I said, well, if you give yourself, she gave yourself shots for years. You should be able to do it better than me. I've never given him a shot. I don't even like needles. You know, for the six months that he had to have them, he has to just give me the game <laughs> every time. And uh, he never slapped me or kicked me or anything. And he's always very good about it. Just, okay, Dad, here you go. You know, so, uh, anyway, do pray for her if you will. She's uh, doing well. She appreciates your prayers, appreciates all that you've done for her. And uh, also appreciates the meals that you brought in, uh, as well as the gift cards and the cards and the, the text and all of those things that come her way. Uh, she does appreciate all of that. We thank you for it. Uh, she said, well, I guess. Maybe we can sneak you in on Sunday morning and, and uh, sneak you out before everybody finds out you're here. But uh, anyway, but she's doing very well. But do continue to pray for her. Again, thank you for being here tonight. Turn to page number 451. Page number 451. Let's all stand. We'll ask the men to come forward to see the offering on the last course. 451. Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore, 
Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Neighbors are kind. I love them, everyone. We get along in sweet accord. But when my soul needs matter from above, where could I go but to the Lord? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is grand with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Need to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Brother Steve's filled with the Spirit because not filled with memory tonight, that's for sure. <laughs> well, all his Holy Spirit folks wore pink today, praise God. <laughs> Miss Beth is like, ooh. <laughs> Roy's like, oh. <laughs> um, forgot what I was doing, sorry. The Holy Spirit plus memory note. Uh, book, of, book of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus says, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I read a quote today from Alexander the Great. He said, I do not fear an army of lions led by a sheep. I fear an army of sheep led by a lion. Now, if you were here last night, that means a lot more to you than what it does if you weren't. If we can get some leaders of lot like lions and attack the gates of hell, how much better would our lives be? How much better would our families be? How much better would our neighborhoods be? How much better would our city be? How much better would our state be? How much better would our nation be? As Brother Jimmy preached last night, Brother Jimmy Jr. preached last night, all it takes is one man, one person, to say, I'm going to stand up. Think what we could do if we had a church full of them. Just think what we could do. You know, a good place to start standing up for God is in your finances. Because that's a hard place to start. It's a hard place to do whether you're starting there or not. So as we receive the offering, let's remember that we're giving not because we have extra. We're giving because we're thumbing our nose at Satan and saying, you will not hold me down. My God is greater than you are. As we receive the offering, I'm going to ask Brother Jason. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you now, and we're here to worship you, God. We're here to praise your name and just thank you for all the things you do for us, God. We ask you to continue to bless as you've blessed us this whole time. Continue to bless the services. Continue to bless the people. Help us as we go throughout our lives to better serve you and help us uh, in this message to get something that you want to give us and something that we need to hear, God, that way we can better serve you, God, by reaching out to others. Father, we ask you to bless this offering. 
use it for your work and will that way we can reach others, God, and reach the lost. Father, and if there's anyone here tonight that does not know 100% with certainty that they're on their way to heaven, God, that they get it right tonight. Father, we ask your blessings on this service, and we love you, and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I do want to say thanks, Pam, for coming and playing. You sure be CDs. I really do. And uh, I appreciate that. I tell you what, it makes it a whole lot easier on me. I promise you that. So thank you, Pam. I want you to know that from the bottom of my heart. As we know it is losing its fire, and some are discouraged from bearing the load. But we must determine to keep pressing on, cause if just one more stone were to walk down the aisle, it'll be worth every struggle. It'll be worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all. If it rescues just one more soul. Preachers keep preaching and singers go sing. And laymen keep sharing that Jesus is King. The angels have gathered, they're surrounding the throne, and they'll start rejoicing 
for just one more show. Cause if just one more show were to walk down the aisle, it'll be worth every struggle. It'll be worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all. If it rescues just one more soul. If just one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it'll be worth every struggle. It'll be worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. If it rescues just one more soul. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. You can stand and uh, let you stand the whole time I preach. And so I have to stand the whole time you sing. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Really, if you would stand as we read the Word of God. I don't know if y'all normally do that. That's just a habit of mine. You know, in Ezra it says that they stood when they read the book. Amen. And I don't believe there's any book like this book. <clears throat> appreciate you being faithful tonight. Those of you who have been here every night and had to endure me, I appreciate it. And whoever's at my church watching this service now, you're in trouble when I find out whoever you are. And so, uh, yeah, I'm in the shower. And uh, you'll be happy to know I took a shower. And my phone is uh, almost vibrating off the vanity in the bathroom. I mean, just going crazy. I said, what in the world? So I get out and I check it out. 37 messages. And they're all from Twitter because of my dad and Miss Amanda and people from my church talking back and forth and they put me in it so it blows up my phone. So now I think I'm going to get a break. I come here and then Michael starts doing it to me. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, phones are a curse. Amen. Tonight is, we're going to try to tie every night together. If you miss Monday and Tuesday night, you didn't miss much. Uh, but I appreciate your hospitality, your kindness, your generosity. And we've had some great services in chapel. It's been a blessing to preach to the young people also. And uh, God saved three yesterday and three today. But And even, a, and not more than that, but also above that, is, uh, I got them to come and stand in front of their peers and say they were committed to serve Christ and to take a stand for Him. And I think 20-something 20, 20 stood up in front of the whole school today and said they want to take a stand for Jesus Christ. And so it was a tremendous blessing. I really believe God's doing something in the school. And so uh, I love young people. I started out as a youth pastor. And uh, my son is now the youth pastor at our church. And he's doing a phenomenal job. And, uh, and I appreciate him. But, you know, I, I don't believe young people are our future. I believe, and if you say that, I, I'm not trying to get on to you. But they're just as much a part of the church as we are now. They're just our future pastors and deacons and teachers. But they're still part of the church. It, it bothers me when people say they're the of the church. They're, they're not. They're, they're already part of the church. So don't ever underestimate your young people. Love them. Appreciate them. I, I know they can be annoying. Yes. I have one teenager left at home. I've had two at, before. And uh, like I said, I was a youth pastor. God bless me. I was a youth pastor. My first Sunday at Open Door Baptist Church in Baton Rouge, we had six teenagers. When I left three years later, we had 89. We had five called to preach, and four of them are still in full-time Christian service today. And uh, I've actually preached for a couple of them, and, and most of them stay in contact with me. And I'm thankful that we didn't waste our time there. I've been Pastor Lighthouse now for 20 years this month. Just celebrated my 20th anniversary as Pastor Lighthouse Baptist Church, only pastor I've ever had. You pastor one place, pastor one place. I believe you ought to stay put if possible. I'm not looking for greener grass. I believe there's a separate thing under that too, amen. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. If my people, Christians, which are called by my name, Christians, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Tonight's the last night of revival. In word only. 
as far as a meeting is concerned. But can I tell you something? We do God a disservice. We do your pastor a disservice. You do me a disservice if tonight ends it in your life. You see, we want it to perpetuate and we want something to be different at Garth Road Baptist Church. I've, I've driven a lot of, well, actually I've ridden, I haven't driven, ridden with your pastor all over Baytown. People need the Lord. There's a lot of people here that need the Lord. And uh, let me say this, you don't have to be around your pastor very long to realize that people who don't even go to church have a, good, have a good rapport with them and a good testimony. That's important. And uh, the young lady at uh, Philly's last night remembered who he was, remembered where he passed, and said she's even busy before. He was very polite, very kind, very gracious. Now today we went to a restaurant, and it took him two hours to get a salad. I don't know if they had to make out a cactus here in Texas or what, but I thought, how in the world does it take two hours to get a salad? So I don't know if I'd recommend that place. But let's pray. Dear Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Meet with us tonight in Jesus' name we pray. And you may be seated. I'm going to go very quickly tonight, which is unusual for me. <clears throat> the the junior high boys in chapel were whining to Brother Mark and said, we can't take notes. He talks too fast. And so I slowed down for him a little bit this morning, but it still didn't help him any. I realized that I can't go in reverse order. <clears throat> Some of you will get that in a minute. On Monday night, if we talk about here, if my people which are called by my name shall humble, shall humble themselves. We're going to tie everything together. When we humble ourselves, we realize that, hey, we can't do the work. We can't be the rowboat. We've got to allow the Lord to do the work through us. We've got to be a sailboat and allow the Lord to push us and take us where we need to go. So that's your first point for the night, and we've already gotten through it. The second thing is we see the fights. So notice what it says. And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. If you read that, a lot of times we think of it as he's talking about wicked things we're involved in, but that's not necessarily exactly what he's saying here. He's saying to turn from the wickedness of the world. In order to do that, we're going to have to fight some Goliaths. And, and while we fight that Goliath, in order for us to turn the way we need to turn to have revival, we've got to make sure we remember what? Last night. Very good. Who, who said that? You get an A+. Plus. We've got to remember the cause. I, I said this, and I uh, was hitting Twitter all over, and I had about 30 preachers. I said, man, Brother Jimmy, that was a great statement. I think Brother Kirk started it. But I, I said, in America, we've outsourced God. But unfortunately, not only have we outsourced God in America, it's coming to our church. We've outsourced God in our churches. And then in our Christian lives, we've outsourced God in our lives. We've got all this knowledge now and all these other things and we started implementing them and we're forgetting the most important thing. Can I tell you something? I don't mean this in a condescending way and your pastor's not like this, but if there's a little bitty church in the middle of nowhere, that pastor's never even finished high school, never gone to college, but he knows how to get a hold of God and I'm here to tell you God's going to do something with that man more than the educated man, more than the doctor before the man's name, with all the little initials behind his name, and the most elaborate place you can go to. We've gotten, and I'm not against beautiful buildings, we have a beautiful building, so please don't take me to the stream, but I'm just telling you, we put our priorities and our focus is on the wrong thing today. And I tell you, the main thing has to maintain being the main thing. And that is us coming to church, worshiping God, and lifting high enough Jesus Christ, the only one who's worthy of being high and lifted up. So many churches, they have forgotten the main thing. And when we forget the main thing, we're nothing but a tinkling brass and a sounding cymbal. We're no longer a church. We're just a fellowship. Now, that's why a lot of churches, it doesn't bother when churches take Baptists off their sign. They ought to take church off of it too. Because all they are is a glorified fellowship hall. They no longer have the preaching of the Word. They no longer open the Word. They no longer run buses. They no longer knock doors. They no longer preach the Bible. So I'm here to tell you, be honest about it. Amen. I'm here to tell you, we need to make sure we get the facts. We can't live the Christian life. But He can live it through us. Then we've got to remember, there's going to be a fight. There's going to be some Goliath in our lives. And we will not defeat Goliath if we don't remember why we're fighting Goliath. The cause has to always be here. You know why preachers quit the ministry? You can give me a lot of symptoms, but I'll give you the root. They forgot the cause. You know why folks quit coming to church? They'll give you a bunch of excuses. They'll blame it on the preacher. They'll blame it on this. They'll blame it on that. But they forgot the cause. 
Because if we remember the cause, we won't quit. Because when we quit, we're quitting on Him. Very important. Tonight, you've already seen Monday night was the facts. We were going somewhere, right? Last night, once we learn the facts and start trying to get it right, we're going to have some fights. Tonight, we've got to maintain our focus. Maintain our focus. I told Lighthouse Baptist Church 20 years ago, I, my first Sunday was October. Well, I've candidated before, but my first Sunday as pastor was October the 3rd, 1995. I was 23 years old. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. Thought I'd be a youth pastor for 30 years. The hardest thing I ever did in my life was have that last Sunday with those young people. Broke my heart. I wasn't looking to leave. And let me say this to you as a church. I want to, Can I help you? I feel like this is an extension. I just feel like I'm your far away assistant pastor. Is that okay? I'm not trying to push Brother Weatherly out or anything. But man, I love your pastor to death. I love his family. But Brother Jim, Miss Karen, Michael mean the world to me. I've got a new sister, Miss Amanda. And uh, you guys are near and dear to my heart. So I, I just preach to you like I do at home. But, it, but if Brother Jim ever leaves, don't look for a man that's looking to leave. You understand what I'm saying? If a man's in a church, he's not happy that church. It won't be long, he won't be happy in yours either. So whenever Lighthouse called me, they said, uh, we, we, we're looking for a pastor. I said, I'm not, look, I'm not a youth pastor. I'm very happy where I am. And they said, we want you to come candidate then. And I said, well, you know, I'll pray about it. And I did. And I never thought God would call us away. Man, God was blessed. We were having the time of our life in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And uh, God was blessing, and we went to Lighthouse Baptist Church, and we knew right away. Even though I didn't have a clue, I didn't know how to pastor, I still don't. First Sunday, I went and visited there. I don't even think there were ten people there. And the church had been through three pastors in like two years, and I thought, that's not good. And I met with the deacons, and then I realized why they'd been through so many pastors in such a short period of time. And I thought, dear God, please don't do this to me. I'm very happy where I am. It's a lot more fun being Timothy instead of Paul. But we were driving home. My wife and my son, Joshua, that time was an infant. On our way home, I just began to weep. And Connie said, I was waiting. I said, why? She said, I don't know either, but I know. She said, God wants us here. I said, why? I don't want to leave. I love those young people. And they were like my kids. So many of them from broken homes. And so many of them needed somebody. And I thought, man, that's where I want to be. Then we came to Lighthouse Baptist Church. And man, God's blessed us in an extraordinary way. And it has nothing to do with me. I said all that to say this. When I first came to Lighthouse, I said, listen, folks. The number one part at Lighthouse will always be here. And if I ever leave, I want to leave Lighthouse Baptist Church with two things that Lighthouse Baptist Church will forever be committed to. Number one, prayer. Number two, soul. I said, if I study this book the way I study this book, Jesus Christ, the priorities in His life were praying and soul. So, so if we're going to be the type of church that we need to be, we need to do Can I tell you something? I think my church is grasping. We pray before every service. We normally have about 30 folks at least praying before every service. When we go out soul winning, there's times we'll fill up two buses to go soul winning. We have now had somebody saved for 153 consecutive weeks at Lighthouse Baptist Church. We have folks leading folks to the Lord at Walmart. We have folks leading folks to the Lord at work. We had a young lady that led another student at, at the college to the Lord. Can I tell you something? It gets contagious. Amen? Don't ever lose you. There's going to be some trials. There's going to be some hardships. There's going to be some heartaches. There's going to be some disappointments. But don't lose focus. I've been through a tough time. I mentioned it last night. I told Dad, I said, if I say anything, it'll be because God wants me to say it, not because I want to say it. There are a lot of things I want to say. And i tell you something. You have a godly man. And I'm going to say it again. You have a godly man that's leading you, that loves the Lord, that loves his family, and that loves you. That's more than probably 75% of the church in the United States of America have today. 
They have a man that stands up here that's getting a paycheck, but he's looking for the next best gig. I'm just telling you, I'm, I, I hate to admit it, but I'm, I'm around them all the time. I mean, I went to a conference a couple of weeks ago, and the whole time I'm there, hey, man, you know the church looking for a preacher? I'm about to need a guy. I, I hear it everywhere I go. Hey, man, I'm looking for a church down in Florida. What? Really? I was an interim pastor in Florida. I hated it. I had never been to Mississippi in my life. So God called me there. I still can't understand half of what they say. But I know that's where God wants me. Amen. And I'm from Georgia, and I still can't understand it. How can we stay focused? I'm going to give you 15 things tonight. Just kidding. Some of you started headed toward the door. You said amen, because I said you're heading to the door. I understand. We're going to stay focused. We've got to be like a man by the name of John. I don't even know who John is. You talk about a man who had focus. John had focus. How many of you want to stay focused? This message is for you. But if you don't, you might as well go ahead and leave now, not waste your time. This is for those that want to stay focused. Go if you will, we're going to look at a lot of verses tonight. John chapter 13. If we really want to have revival, we've got to realize we've got to know the facts. We've got to make sure we know there's going to be some fights. And number three, we've got to make sure we stay focused. And I'm going to give you all these points under focus because I gave you other points on Monday and Tuesday night. Amen. John chapter 13. <clears throat> John chapter number 13. Verse number 21 through 23. It says, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. We all know from the Bible that's talking about John. Can I tell you, in order for us to stay focused, we've got to sit where others don't sit. If we're going to stay focused, we've got to sit where others don't sit. Come here, Michael. You're going to have me preach tonight. I told you we're going to. I love this. This is my buddy right here. I'm going to let Michael be Jesus, okay? Sit down, Jesus. Now, how many disciples were there? Twelve disciples. So, out of those twelve, twelve guys could have made the choice that John made. But even out of those twelve disciples, only one made the choice to sit where others would not sit. And John chose to sit right next to Jesus because John wanted to stay focused. John knew the facts. John knew there were going to be some fights. And John knew if he was going to get through those fights and he was going to make sure he remembered those facts, he was going to have to stay focused on the one. His name is Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? If you're going to stay focused, you're going to have to sit where others are not willing to sit. Thank you, Jesus. Not only was John willing to sit where others would not sit. But secondly, go to John chapter 19 with me. John chapter number 19. This is good stuff if you'll stay with me. Verse 25 and 26. It says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Can I tell you, if you're going to stay focused, you're going to have to stand where others are unwilling to stand. Here's John. Remember, some of the other disciples ran away. They were scared. Are you with me? Here's Jesus up on the cross. Here's his mother. Can you imagine how heartbroken she is? And you know what? John didn't care what happened to him. He could have been caught. He could have been dragged away. He could have been crucified. But there he is standing at the foot of Jesus once again. You know why? Because John did not lose his focus. He is willing to stand where others are not willing to to stand. Not only was he willing to stand where others would not stand, but thirdly, go if you would to John chapter number 21. So now so you can get there. I didn't think it would be that hard. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast, therefore now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now you say, what's so significant about that? Go back with me, if you would, to, verse, to the first verse, chapter number 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the seas of Tiberias, and on the wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel and Canaan, Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two of the other disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I go a fishing. Can I tell you right here? Simon Peter forgot the facts. He lost the fight. He lost his focus. 
Go on down, notice what it says. They say unto him, We also go with thee. When someone, <coughs> Garth Road Baptist Church, forgets the facts and starts fighting the wrong fight, they'll take others with them when they've lost their focus. I'm leaving. It'll be okay. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Can I tell you something? Simon Peter was a fisherman, but he wasn't supposed to still be a fisherman. But you see, Goliath came, and he lost his focus. Notice what verse 4 says. But when the morning was now come, Jesus still on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was. What a truth. You know why? They lost their focus. But then you go down in verse 6. In verse 7. And who sees what others don't see? God. Because John maintained his focus. Not only that, if you go back to the cross, he said, remember your mother. You're going to stay focused. You've got to serve where others are not willing to serve. So you got sitting where others won't sit. Standing where others won't stand. Seeing what others won't see. And serving where others won't serve. I'm reminded of the story in the Gospels when it talks about Jesus looks at one of the disciples and says, Go get me a donkey. Can you imagine that? You're one of the disciples. You want me to do what? Go get a donkey. Disciples never stopped saying that. But how important was that donkey? A lot of things happened after he went and got that donkey for Jesus. Did. You know what? He kept his focus. But now let's go over to the grand finale, in my opinion. Go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter number 1. In your Bible, it may say the revelation of St. John the Divine. I don't like that. Because it tells you in verse 1 who the revelation is. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, that's nitpicky. Well, no, I don't think so. we got so many folks want to take the things away from Jesus anyway, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant. Who? God. Why not Peter? Why not Paul? Why not David? Why not Andrew? Jesus could have chosen anyone to do revelation. But he chose John. Can I tell you why I believe, as we close this short message, but I believe it's powerful why he chose John? Because John realized the facts. He couldn't live the Christian life on his own. He had to let Jesus do it through. John realized there were going to be some fights. There were going to be some Goliaths in his life. So he needed to remember the cause. And then John stayed focused. He sat where others were unwilling to sit. He stood where others were unwilling to stand. He served where others were unwilling to serve. He saw what others were unwilling to see. So he got to see what others would never get to see. Nobody else got to see Revelation. If you study this book the way I study this book, this is almost the way it is. Jesus took John and showed him all this. He got to visibly see everything that happened in Revelation. Well, you talk about a trip. That's a trip. So you say, preacher, what are you saying tonight? You're going to help me preach. You were here Monday and Tuesday night. You were supposed to bring a towel. You got your towel. Only if you have a towel, you come to the front. This will be your first and maybe your last message ever, but you get to preach tonight.
Don't make me work, but I'm working because I love you and I want to help you. Remember, Monday night we talked about we have a sale, right? It's our choice what we do with that sale, whether we're going to what scandalize it or not, right? What scandalize it mean? It means fold it up, not have it where it needs to go, right? You're members of Garth Road Baptist Church, right? So Monday night I said, listen, you got to have your sale ready, right? Not the little wimpy sale we start out with. You got to open it up and be a sailboat. Remember, let Jesus guide you with His power where He wants you to go. Amen? Next, you've got to remember, Goliath's going to fight when you have your sail open. He's not concerned about those that don't have the sail open. He's only concerned about those that have the sail open. Right? Alright? You just went through a battle. If you were honest with me, some of you dropped your sail. Some of you scandalized your sail. But if you're going to see things at Garth Road Baptist Church that nobody else is going to see, you've got to keep standing when others won't stand. You've got to keep sitting where others are unwilling to sit. You've got to keep serving when others don't want to serve. And you've got to start seeing what others don't want. And if you do that and you keep that sail open, think about how much power God can put in all these sails through Garth Road Baptist Church. And you listen to me, church, and I'm done. You'll see some revelations from Jesus Christ that no other church will ever see. You'll get to see things that only Jesus can show you if you just stay up to you. I've done all I can do. God bless you. It's your invitation.